If you will, go ahead and start turning to Joshua chapter 4. <clears throat> I just read out of Luke chapter 22, verse 19. You may be wondering why I would pick that verse and then I'll automatically go back to Joshua chapter 4. I'll tell you here in just a second. For those who are here today who've never been here, I always mention there are outlines through the door on the right-hand side. Those outlines will have almost every verse that I will use. I will add uh, some on the fly, but for the most part, that will be all of the verses. <clears throat> That's so you can go back and verify everything that I've told you to make sure that it is accurate. It keeps both uh, myself and you accountable. I begin to think a little bit throughout the, this week, uh, and I begin to think about some comments that were made pertaining to the Lord's Supper. Uh, we talked a little bit about this throughout Bible study, and there are some today who, who really diminish the importance of the Lord's Supper. They really diminish the importance of this memorial that we partake in. And because of that, uh, there are congregations out there that only partake in the Lord's Supper uh, monthly. Some will do it quarterly. There are those that do it once a year in some religious groups. Then you've got those who will flippantly take it whenever they want. Uh, and so I began to think about that. And how exactly do we explain the importance of a memorial? Well, today I'm going to do that, but I'm actually going to do it by, by using the Old Testament. However, uh, as you know, I never preach out of the Old Testament without tying it back to the New Testament. And so we're going to look at a, an Old Testament account, uh, and as I draw this all together at the end, I think it's going to make sense to you. I'm going to read from Joshua chapter 4, verses 19 through 24. And to give you an idea of what we're going to be talking about, the title of the sermon is, What Do These Stones Mean? Joshua 4, verses 19 through 24. And the people came up out of Jordan on the tenth day of the first month and encamped in Gilgal in the east border of Jericho. And those twelve stones which they took out of Jordan did Joshua pitch in Gilgal. And he spake unto the children of Israel, saying, When your children should ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean these stones? Then ye shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan from before you until ye were passed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up from before us until we were gone over, that all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it's mighty, that ye might fear the Lord your God forever. <coughs> God's people, the Israelites, they're now under uh, the leadership of Joshua. They've just entered into this this promised land which was promised to their forefathers. And, and you go back and you consider all of the events that took place prior to Joshua eventually becoming the leader. And you see that they uh, had gone through 400 years of, of bondage in Egypt. It had finally ended. Moses had led them for some 40 years prior to his death in the land of Moab. We know that God's law had been given to His people at Sinai. And now the Jordan River... <clears throat> The Jordan River has just been crossed on dry ground. That in and of itself is, is miraculous enough. And the children of Israel, they're now in this promised land that had been promised to them so long ago. But what do they do first? <clears throat> well, under God's instructions, Joshua establishes a memorial. He has one man from each of these tribes go out and they grab a rock from this Jordan River and they take that rock and then they, they build this memorial. And the memorial was here so that they would, they would always remember what was taking place. Now, he mentioned they, they had crossed the Jordan on dry ground, very similar to the crossing of the Red Sea in both of those accounts. And I want to just imagine for a minute, and if you know how powerful the Jordan River was, imagine that water literally being stopped and held back so that they could cross on dry ground. Very similar to the crossing of the Red Sea in which that water was, was miraculously held back. Well, these memorials uh, that we are familiar with, these memorials are for the purpose of, of just reminding us of certain events. Uh, they serve as a valuable lesson to following generations. You, you were to think about the world that we live in today. We have memorials in our physical world. Most of you have probably gone and even seen some of them. You could think about the Twin Towers. You could think about the Lincoln Memorial. Or if you were to even go out, say, our front door and look to the right, you'll see a tree over there. Uh, for Brother Corsella. I hope I pronounced that right because I never say your last name. Why is that there? It's a memorial. It's so that people will always remember. 
Memorials in the physical world, they're, they're not something that's unusual to us. We also have memorials uh, regarding spiritual things. Most important, we have the Lord's Supper each Sunday, Acts 20, verse 7. I talked about the fact that many people will take the Lord's Supper on other days. It's not a big deal, really. Acts 20, verse 7, it was upon the first day of the week. So I can take the Lord's Supper anytime I want on the first day of the week, but I can never take it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or Saturday. And I can't skip certain Sundays. I take it every Sunday, right? We understand that. It is a memorial of our gathering together, Luke 22, 19. It's where we come together and we remember exactly what our Lord and Savior did for us. And as our reaction to what He's done for us, we come together and we worship Him as part of this memorial. So I began to think about memorials and how many people really don't understand, especially regarding the Lord's Supper. The following generations would have gathered together as they saw these stones from the Jordan River. They would have seen them piled up and some of them would have asked, what do these stones mean? Or if you go back and you look at the King James, it renders it this way. What mean these stones? When asking, I'm going to tell you there's some very important questions that will have been raised. And in answering, some valuable lessons would be taught. You know, it's interesting when you ask a question, sometimes you'll get a different answer from different people, and the answer that you get is still correct. There are multiple answers to this question. What do these stones mean? Those who had a different understanding and had the knowledge would have been able to give the answers. So let's look at a few of them. Somebody would have came up and asked one of their parents or, or an elder or somebody with knowledge, and they would have said, what do these stones mean? And their response may have been, these stones mean that our God is a God of providence and provision. We have to consider there are sometimes those who just don't know what the older generations know. I hope that we as Christians will remember that. There are those who are older and oftentimes wiser than those of us who are younger. There are times when I've had troubles where you know, I didn't know who to go to, so you know who I called? I called the oldest preacher I could find. Why? He's probably seen some things that I've never seen. He's probably dealt with some things that I have never dealt with. Well, oftentimes people are going to go to those who have the knowledge, and they're going to ask them questions like this. What do these stones mean? And the answer could have been that God is a God of providence and provision. He cares for His people. He loves His people. God had made provisions uh, all throughout the past. So I go back and I, I began to list a couple of examples. Many of them you are familiar with. You think about Joseph. Joseph, when all the horrible things that his, his brothers had done to him, and Joseph who's down in Egypt and he actually provides the grain which is going to preserve the Hebrew nation and the seed line. That's God working right there. Moses who was raised up to be God's deliverer. Moses who could have had everything but he was willing to forsake everything for God. You think about the manna and the quail that was provided to them while they were in the wilderness during the Exodus, even though they were out there complaining nonstop, right? But God continues to provide for them. You think about the Israelites who were given the law at Sinai, trying to figure out how to be righteous in God's sight and how to be justified, and he's, they're given His law. You think about the Israelites who were protected from their enemies while they were faithful. You begin to think about how God had... Uh, guided them. He'd given them the cloud during the day, and He'd given them the pillar of fire by night. And then I began to think about all the different ways that God had showed His graciousness to them. And God does the exact same thing for us today in the Christian dispensation. God does take care of His faithful followers. Sometimes that's hard to understand. It is. How many of you, sat, how many of you have sat with somebody who was struggling, either through a death or through a marriage problem or, or, or an issue with a child and they say, I just don't understand why God would have me to deal with such things. Sometimes the, easy, the, the answers are not easy to understand. But God does provide for us during this Christian dispensation. Listen to 1 Peter 2.9. And I want you to listen to how we're described. And I want you to ask yourself, do you apply this description to yourself? He says, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. How did He provide for us? He gave us this kingdom. He gave us the church. We are His called out people. And you see how He describes us. The idea is you're different from everybody else out there. Those Jews coming into this promised land, 
They needed to understand they were different than those who are around them like we are. And we are described as a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. We don't need the Levitical tribe anymore to offer sacrifices on our behalf, do we? We are a royal priesthood and holy nation, peculiar people. We are. We're different than those people out in the world because we don't do things like they do. And the reason why is because we know God's law and we're trying to live by it. The Jews were given a promised land. I'm going to tell you what we were promised. We were promised a kingdom without boundaries. That ought to give us a little bit more security than than what they had. You need to understand the safety in the kingdom. And many people don't understand about the kingdom or the church today. I want you to listen to what Paul says in Romans 8 verses 35 through 39, as he talks about this. Now again, many don't understand this idea of this this safety or security that we have. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. I'm going to go back to that here in a minute. Maybe you remember how that's, how that's phrased in the original language, more than conquerors. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We are blessed in so many ways as part of this kingdom. Are we going to be tried? Yeah. Are we going to struggle through some situations? We are. And notice how he describes us. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. In the Greek, we are super victors. Meaning, when I get through that, whatever it is that I'm dealing with, and I get through it faithfully, guess where I'm going to, guess where I'm going to end up? I'm going to end up in heaven. Nothing can separate a Christian from the love of God except for himself. I want you to remember that. It doesn't matter how bad it is. If you will be faithful, nothing can separate you from the love of God. You will be a super victor. We're blessed in many ways. We are the spiritual Israel today in the church, and His providence is abundance. There are some that would ask, what do these stones mean? And from another older person, they might get a totally different answer. And the answer might be this. These stones mean that each succeeding generation needs to be taught about God. I mean, that's the entire purpose of a memorial, right? Why do we have memorials? It's to get people to remember about something that has already taken place. It's to get them to understand something related to God. That's why we have spiritual memorials, right? Those rocks were there for a reason. Why do we have the Lord's Supper? Why is it a memorial? Again, there's a reason behind it. Listen to Joshua 4. 21 and 22. And he spake unto the children of Israel, saying, When your children shall ask their fathers in times to come, saying, What mean these stones? Then ye shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry land. Why do you need to tell them that? Notice again, you need to let your children know. The answer is given in Joshua 4.24, that all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty that ye might fear the Lord your God forever. Do you see that same mighty God working through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ when we have the the Lord's Supper? you ever think about that? That memorial that we have today, how similar it is to this memorial? How we can see the hand of God working? There are some things that should never be forgotten. There are some things that should always be remembered. Think about the simple things in life. What do you do when you have a little child that's just now starting to be able to learn? And you begin to take their shoes. How many of you have done it, right? And you cross them, and you, usually you sing a song. It's either the bunny going around the tree, or I don't know which way you learned it. We all learned it differently. But you begin to teach them things that they're going to need later in life. There are spiritual things that we need to be teaching people because they're going to need those foundations and fundamentals later in life. Just as important as being able to tie your shoes. And he says here, when your children begin to ask, you need to explain them to them. In Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 9, Moses had commanded the people to go out and to teach their children, to teach their grandchildren, and the list goes on and on. And the whole reason was God wanted to make sure that His people knew the law. Why? Well, one, so that they could be righteous in His sight. But two, so that 
they wouldn't have a reason to come back and to say, I, I didn't know how to, to make sure that, that I was righteous in God's sight. They didn't have anybody to blame it on but themselves. They were told how to, how to take care of this. What God wants to be taught needs to be taught the way God wants it to be taught. And the parents are the ones who are supposed to go and to teach. Right? It's the obligation of the parents to teach the children. And those children will eventually teach their children. And the, you see how it just continues to go on and on and on? Christianity has always been an exponential religion, whether we're dealing with children or whether we're dealing with those outside the church, right? I teach a non-believer, and he believes, and then he teaches a non-believer, and he believes. And if each of them's teaching one, you've got a whole group here just growing. And it works the same way with our family. Some families are bigger. My dad's one of seven. Not as big as some families. But if their parents would have taught each of them the Bible and they would have each taught their children. You know how many Christians you would have? You know how many Christians you have out of my, my parents' family? Out of my grandfather's family? Me. You know why? Because none of those children were taught the truth. None of them. So they, therefore, didn't go out and teach their children the truth because they simply didn't know it. And it's a shame. We as parents have the responsibility to go out and to teach. It's the exact same principle that we find in the New Testament. Listen to Ephesians 6.4. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. I'm going to tell you, Sunday and Wednesday night Bible studies, those are great. But I'm going to tell you what, those are not replacements for the parents' duties. We get how long? I go long, sometimes 45 minutes, right? So let's say somebody has 45 minutes with your child on maybe Sunday and Wednesday. Twice a week, that's if you show up both times. And oftentimes the children that need it most, they're not showing up both times. You think we're going to teach them what they need to know in 45 minutes twice a week? No. They need to be taught at home. All we do is simply come back and reaffirm and try to fix maybe an area that you might be off in. We're not the foundational teaching. We don't have time for that. Not only that, that's not how God set it up. We as parents are responsible for our children. And then they will be responsible for theirs. And I'm going to tell you this, if you won't teach your children, the world will. The world will teach them. But let me tell you, they're not going to teach them the right things. They're going to teach them the wrong things. They're not going to teach them about eternal things. They're going to teach them about temporary things. They're not going to teach them about spiritual things. They're going to teach them about earthly things. They're not going to teach them about the value and the sacredness of human life. What they're going to teach them is euthanize it, kill it, or use your body for whatever you want that brings pleasure to you. They're going to teach them all kinds of non-biblical things. We as parents have that responsibility. They're not going to teach them about God. They're not. They're going to teach them God doesn't exist. And if they were willing to even condone for a second that there is such a thing as a God, they're going to say, but He doesn't love you. He's nothing more than a vacant landlord who got the earth spinning and allowed evolution to take place. Another big lie. That's the kind of stuff the world teaches. And that's why we need sound parents to teach the truth. <clears throat> the world teaching your children is no replacement for what we as parents need to be doing. I'm going to tell you one untaught generation, one untaught generation could very well take this congregation and the church in general into apostasy. And you may say that'll never happen. It is happening all around us. Look at the other congregations around us. They are teaching air. Watch the news. I just saw a religious group on the news the other day who just who just started to have their first <clears throat> same-sex marriage uh, preachers. I'm wording it the best I can. Really? Really? One generation from apostasy, right? When did that start? Paul knew about apostasy. You consider his warning to the Ephesian elders. Listen to Acts 20, verses 29 through 31. For I know this that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you. He didn't just say, I think this is going to happen. He said, I know this, not sparing the flock, also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Paul knew it was going to happen. Paul wasn't confused. He told them that it was going to happen. Three years. 
Can you imagine teaching somebody the same thing over and over and over again for three years, and then they still let it happen? Has that happened in congregations? Where they've been taught the truth for so long, and all of a sudden they decide to, <clears throat> to not follow the truth? Paul charges Timothy to warn, warn the Ephesians about a different doctrine. Listen to 1 Timothy 1.3. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Now, I don't watch these guys on TV a lot. I will tell you this. <clears throat> Maybe somebody else watched. Anybody watch the debate on TV on uh, GBN this week? My wife will tell you I was yelling at the TV. I get so mad. I get so mad to see somebody misuse the scriptures. Some of them simply don't know. Some of them don't. Some of them were just taught wrong. Some do know. And as I began to think about this, I began to think somebody even this week mentioned about Brother Garland Elkins. Maybe many of you don't know him, but when Billy Graham was down in Memphis, he, he went and actually spoke to him. He pulled Billy Graham to the side and he said, you know, you teach error regarding salvation. And then he, he began to read the verses to him. And you know what Billy Graham said? I'm too far into this thing to turn around now. I want you to think about that for a minute. I'm too far into this to turn around now. You may say that's horrible. How many families in other religious groups have said that? My parents said it. Couldn't you find something closer to what you were raised in? You know the mentality? We're too far into this to turn around now. We've always been Catholic since the 1400s. How could you leave that? We're too far into this to turn around now. There are those in the world today who have this mentality. They're too far into it. They believe another doctrine. They're teaching another doctrine. And I tell you, in spite of all these warnings that were given to the church there in Ephesus, we know they left their first love. You go back to the very end of the first century, Revelation 2.4, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. How easy is it to slip away from your first love, especially when you don't have somebody who's willing to tell you the truth repeatedly time and time and time again. You begin to water down the Bible. You begin to quit giving invitations. You begin to start to stray away from the things that, that the sound men of years past used to do. And I'm going to tell you, you're on, dangerous, you're on dangerous slippery grounds. You're just one step away from apostasy. So what do those stones mean? mean that each generation needs to be taught about God and His doctrine. Somebody else might say, well, what exactly do these stones mean? And another person who's there with the wisdom might say, you know what, conviction is more important than convenience. That's what these stones mean. You may say, how would you, how would you come to that conclusion? <clears throat> God had desired these Israelites when they came into this promised land that they were going to remember Him through obedience to the law of Moses. God desired from the very beginning that they were going to keep themselves separate from the pagans around them, right? They were, going to, they were going to keep themselves pure. They weren't going to intermingle. They weren't going to get involved in those things. And you may say, was it really that bad? They were entering into an area where people were worshiping false gods. How would it be for a man who was a faithful Jewish man living under the law of Moses to marry a pagan who wasn't living under that law? Let's ask ourselves, how are the kids going to worship? Does that sound like a question answered, asked oftentimes today? How are the kids going to worship? I began to think about that. I can use myself as an example, and I don't really worry about if people get upset because it's me. When I got married, I was a Catholic. My wife was not. She was a Methodist. So you know what we said? How are we going to worship? You know what we did? We compromised. We were both wrong, but the only way to solve a situation with that is compromise, right? Right? So what happens when these people, they go into this land, they've been delivered from bondage, God's cared for them time and time and time again, and He says, remain pure in that land, and then they began to intermingle. They began to intermarry. Listen to Joshua 4.21. And He warned them about this, because they had a glorious past, and they had an even greater, greater future waiting for them. He says, And He spake unto the children of Israel, saying, When your children shall ask their fathers in time to come, notice that key phrase there, in time to come, saying, What mean these stones? There's going, to be, there's going to be future generations ahead of this one. And they're going to ask, well, what's the whole meaning behind these stones? They needed to understand that their God had a plan for them. 
They needed to tell everybody in the future generations what that plan was and that they were supposed to be a pure, distinct, set-apart group of people. Consider the church for just a minute. <clears throat> the church has had a glorious past. You go back and you begin to look in the Old Testament. You begin to read the, the prophecy talking about and pointing to nonstop. There's a church. There's a Messiah. The church is coming. We talked about the mystery. Jew and Gentile in this church. It's coming. And then we see that there was the church established in Jerusalem. We see its growth all through the book of Acts. And then you see it carried over into the epistles where not only some of the churches were growing, but they were told how to live and how to be faithful. And then we see that it survived persecution even during the dark ages, only to come out victorious again. And I read all these doomsday uh, things on the internet where people are saying the church is struggling. And No, it's not. It's not. How many of you think this congregation is struggling right now? Because we have how many? What's the number? 50? I don't know. We're stronger than we've ever been. The church will always exist. Always. It may only have a couple of people in it in each congregation. It will always exist. And that congregation that still exists will be strong. The fact that it even exists at all shows the providence of God. But not only the providence of God, it shows our personal free will to be in alignment with His Word to make sure that it exists. Not to just say, that's not a big deal, we won't worry about that. It's to put our foot down and say, we're going to do it the way God says to do it. And when we do that, we know that we'll be blessed and we're going to continue to grow. I want you to listen to Colossians 1.23. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Why don't you consider for just a second. Paul, he says they taught the whole world. Now, we, we, we saw that not long ago just in Bible study. We saw his missionary journeys. He taught everyone. Matter of fact, he said, he said one of the spots, everybody's been taught in this area, I'm going to have to move on. Can you imagine if we taught all of, all of Portage and Kalamazoo? Can you imagine that? We've got to be concerned with teaching the gospel to the people who are alive during our lifetime. Because if we're not going to go out and teach them, the world will. Listen to Ephesians 3.10. <clears throat> I couldn't read all the verses, so I'll just give you the last one and sum up the previous nine. Paul wrote to the Ephesian church in chapter 3, verse 10, to the intent that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places, might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. What is that manifold wisdom of God? It's covered in the, in the previous nine verses, verses 1 through 9. The manifold wisdom was this. Go out and teach the gospel. Teach the gospel. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's as simple as this. It is open for everyone, whether Jew and Gentile, in one church. That's ten verses all summed up right there. And the church came through a glorious age when there were men who, when they were questioned or when they were asked about questions or when they, were, when they met false doctrine, they, they met it head on. And they didn't say, I think. They didn't say, I feel. They said, thus saith the word. That's why I got so angry as I watched these two men debate on baptism because I, I saw the one that would say, he said this, and then he would say, but the Bible teaches, and he'd give the verse. And I'd watch the other guy, and he'd say, he'd give verses, but he'd misuse them, use them out of context. We need to remember that as a, as a congregation, we have to continue the work that God has assigned to the church. You know, I mentioned that uh, there's a memorial out the door there to the right. There are a lot of congregations who have had faithful members who have struggled, who have worked so hard, who have sacrificed to make sure that the gospel is kept pure. And that future now demands that we in the congregation do that. We can't rest on faithful men of the past. We can't. We appreciate their work. We do. Most congregations that exist are because some faithful man was working to establish a faithful congregation in that community, right? We're, we're glad of the work that they did, but we can't rest on that. Some of those men aren't here anymore. Some of them don't have the ability to go out and work like they used to. And so now it's time for us to step up. We have to start working. It's sad how many congregations are no longer faithful. We can't go onward and forward without the word of truth. I want you to remember that like the Israelites, we have a past. We also have a glorious future. Those stones meant that, that they had a past, but they also had a future. 
<clears throat> our part in history may have varied. And I want you to consider this congregation right now, and I'll start to draw this to a close. This is one of my shorter sermons. <clears throat> you begin to think about this congregation here. There are many here today who either were too young to remember. They may have been new converts, and so they weren't really plugged into the congregation. There may be some here who really weren't even interested in, in spiritual things at the time, and there are some here who didn't even attend here when this congregation first started. <clears throat> and so there are certain things they may not know. And I began to think about the Old Testament, where somebody came up and said, what about these stones? What do they mean? You've got people today who are even asking that in regards to the Lord's Supper. What's the purpose of the Lord's Supper? Why do you even have the memorial? And I'm going to tell you the answer for what is the purpose of these stones is the same answer as to why we have the Lord's Supper. <clears throat> that memorial means that our God is a God of providence. And I know that. I can't always see providence taking place. Providence is a hard thing to understand. <clears throat> but if you think back to how it is that you became a Christian, you think about the people who were placed in, in the positions to teach you the gospel, you think about some of the things that have, have taken place so that you could teach someone else the gospel. <clears throat> you think about how the church uh, oftentimes has avoided persecution. And I assure you, our God is a God of providence. We should remember that when we're taking the Lord's Supper. Each of these memorials meant that each succeeding generation needed to be taught about God. Why do we even have the Lord's Supper? Why did they have those stones? Teach the next generation about your God. This memorial is to teach them a spiritual lesson. Why do we come together and have the Lord's Supper as a memorial? Some congregations don't. Some don't do it at the frequency that they should. But I'm going to tell you what, it's not a real complicated thing, right? We gather together and Lewis... Lewis just walked out for a second, but Lewis covered my whole sermon in his prayer before uh, the Lord's Supper. He talked about providence. He talked about a bunch of the stuff that I'm talking about right now. He came up and said, that was a good prayer, Lewis. It was. What's the purpose of the Lord's Supper? We understand that our God is a God of providence. We understand that memorials are so that we'll teach the next generation about God. They help us to understand that conviction is more important than convenience. Maybe it is more convenient to only have the Lord's Supper once a month. Is it biblical? No. Maybe it's more convenient to not do it at all. Maybe let's just do it once a year. I had somebody knock on my door. Hey, we're having the, we're having the, uh, the feast this, you know, they do it one time per year. We'd love you to come to gather together. And I said, why do you guys only do it once a year? They said, well, in the Old Testament, they took me to the verse. You see there where they have the feast, the Passover. I said, yeah, the Passover was. I said, what about Acts 20, verse 7? Why don't we read that? When did they have the Lord's Supper? Oh, it was every, every first day. You know what their answer was to that? Nothing. You know why? Because it was a, thus saith the word. There's no refuting the word of God. We have memorials to help us understand that our God is a God of providence. That each generation needs to hear about the word of God and needs to understand how they've been blessed by God. And they need to understand that <clears throat> memorials help us to understand that uh, conviction is more important than convenience. And also we need to understand that God's people had a past, but they also are going to have a future. That memorial... I think about God's people all the way from the Old Testament. <clears throat> As we see the seed line being carried to fruition, and we then see His shedding of His blood, but He gives this memorial in a, before He died. And He says, when you do this, remember me. Why? Remember all the things that the faithful people of God had to do prior to His death. And think about the things that we as faithful Christians must do now after His death. We all had a past. Some of our pasts were not very good. Some of us don't like to talk about our pasts. We all had a past. We all have new, new futures in Christ. <clears throat> as I draw this to a close, <clears throat> I focus on two things every time I preach. And here's the two things. One, I'm concerned about whether or not you've been added to the church. And I don't mean you've joined this church. What I mean is, have you done what the Bible teaches? You can ask a lot of people a lot of different things about how to be faithful and how to be considered righteous in God's sight. And it's not complicated. What we find, and, and as I watched this gentleman speak the other day, he actually had a conversion account up there. It was great because he said, notice here, every one of these acts ended in the same culminating act. In every conversion account, somebody taught the Word of God. Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. People heard the Word of God, and then they believed, right? 
But without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I heard the word of God. I believed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God in the flesh, and I know that he shed his blood so that my sins could be forgiven. Why is that important? All men have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23, and the consequence for that is death. But it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. Jesus said in Luke 13, 3, I tell you, nay, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Now that you understand your sins and you know that I shed my blood so your sins could be forgiven, you need to repent. Confess the name of Christ, Romans 10, 9 and 10. Jesus himself said in Matthew 10, 32 and 33, If you will not confess me before men, neither will I confess you before my Father which is in heaven. We confess him through our words and through our deeds. That's not enough. You've got to put him on in baptism. Acts 2, 38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus commanded it as well, Mark 16, 15 and 16. None of that was my opinion. None of it. The Scriptures teach you need to obey the Gospel, and the culminating act at which you get into Christ is baptism. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. And I'm going to tell you what, it does save you. 1 Peter 3, 18 through 21. So before you leave, ask yourself, have you been added to the church by the Lord? Acts 2, 47. You don't join this church. I don't add you to this church. We don't just sign you up on a list. When you've done what God tells you to do, He adds you to the body. Ask yourself before you leave, have you done what I just told you? None of it was my opinion. If you have not, I'll sit down with you as soon as service is done and and talk with you and study with you. Please don't leave here if you've not been baptized. If you're here and you're a Christian... I want you to honestly look back over your week because none of us is perfect. Let's each of us humble ourselves and say, you know what, I try as hard as I can, but sometimes I mess up. And if you have and, and it's between you and God, deal with it between you and God. 1 John 1, 7 and 9, repent of it, turn from it. If you've done something publicly and people know about it and you've brought reproach upon your family, the church, you might have to deal with that publicly. But I ask you right now, dig down deep and ask yourself the most two important questions you'll ever ask. Have I been added to the church, and am I living faithful as a Christian? If you're here and there's some way we can help you, you can simply come forward as Brother Jerry leads us in a song of invitation. Just as